Good morning, everybody. We're going to get started. It's um, my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Amy Sweeney as our seminar speaker this morning. Um, Amy, com Dr. Sweeney comes from the University of Sheffield, where she's um, spent the last couple of years. Um, but she actually is collaborating quite widely with lots of um, other research groups on, on funded projects, which I'm sure she'd be happy to tell you about, either during lunch or in your one-on-ones. Um, Dr. Sweeney um, is generally interested in how things that are happening outside of an organism influence the things that are happening inside of an organism, um, with a specific emphasis on parasites and pathogens. And I think this is super important for understanding um, things like rapidly changing environments, like urbanization, um, especially in ag agricultural systems, for example, um, and just climate variability writ large. Um, she's been looking at these types of environmental changes on things like diet um, and nutrition, which has an influence on how parasites and pathogens are dealt with by an organism, and also um, looking at the gut microbiome, which is incre incredibly difficult to study, but I think it's super important to um, be able to link across these scales. Not a lot of researchers are capable of doing it, I think especially because that microbiome link is, is quite difficult to, to quantify. Um, but these cross-scale link linkages are super important for being able to better contextualize like bigger disease ecology questions in a rapidly changing planet. So I'm very excited to hear um, about your talk today. Thanks so much for joining us. Take it away. Sorry. Thanks so much for that introduction, Barbara. I'm really excited to be here and to speak to you all a bit about my work, which broadly considers microbial community dynamics and disease across multiple scales. I have, in some way or another, been working on dynamic within host communities since my undergrad. I worked on a experimental paramiscus system with Andrea Graham, where I was perturbing the parasite community with drug treatments. I then worked at NIH as a postback where I was looking at the impacts of climate change on marine mammal ranges and how that influences their protozoal pathogen communities. I did my PhD at the University of Edinburgh where I investigated the role of diet in shaping parasite communities of wild apodemus mice. And since then I've been working with the SOE sheep project both at the University of Edinburgh and the University of Sheffield investigating the causes and consequences of microbiome dynamics in the wild. I'm also an investigator with the Verena Institute, where my focus is investigating co-infection dynamics and how they influence disease dynamics at a global scale. I've really been fascinated for a very long time about the fact that individuals host these fantastically complex communities, both of commensal and parasitic organisms. Although these communities within the hosts are really on a micro scale, they have these really large implications for host health where we know that things like pathogen interactions might influence the ultimate immune responses that a host mounts, things like the, their commensal composition or their pathogens might influence their behavior, and the composition of these communities can also influence host outcome and survival. However, although these have very obvious and important ways that they might manifest in natural populations, much of what we know about the interactions within these communities and their relationship to hosts have been studied in laboratory models or human systems where we have very controlled environments or resolved time points. So a huge thrust of my research program is really taking these concepts to the wild and trying to understand how these very complex communities can shape the ecology and evolution of their hosts. So just to give you an overview of what the talk today will contain, I'll give a bit of a high level view of my aims to really resolve the role of wild animal microbiomes in the context of global change, focusing on my development of long-term systems to investigate microbiome response to the environment and some tools that I've been investigating using ecological forecasting to look at microbiome stability. And then I'll next turn to what I view as a complementary but slightly different um, sort of area of my research, which is parasite interactions and disease emergence, highlighting insights from some experimental work I've done perturbing the parasite community and giving a brief overview of some of my work looking at virus-virus interactions at a more macroecological scale. So to dive into part one, wild animal microbiomes in the context of global change. We know that wildlife are experiencing rapid and very strong pressures from changing environments that, that can range from pressures such as increasing temperatures, urbanization, and um, increasing frequency of extreme events like wildfires and natural disasters. 
These have fairly well-defined and increasingly common impacts on host health, like their immune responses, condition, and their parasite infection. However, there are ways that hosts are already able to adapt to changing environmental conditions. The gut microbiome, um, we know, has very well-documented and pervasive impacts on host health, such that it really influences the development of the immune response, the host metabolism and digestion, and even things like cognition in humans. And so I became really interested in this idea that the gut microbiome itself could really be a sort of toolkit that might buffer hosts against these changing environments in that it, it's a really complex community. It has a lot of microbes that provide services to the host. So there's a lot of scope for it to adapt to changing pressures such that the host can sort of mitigate some of these consequences of change. However, because these communities are so dynamic and responsive to perturbation, it's also very possible that they are vulnerable to severe disruption by these increasing global change events. And if the microbiome is disrupted severely enough, it can have negative impacts on host health, which might exacerbate some of the risks of global change for wildlife. So it's very important to understand First of all, how stable the host microbiome is in response to environmental perturbation. And second of all, whether a plastic response or resilience to these perturbations is going to be ultimately beneficial for the host. This is very difficult to study in the wild because very few study systems have environmental and host data at a sufficient resolution, enough longitudinal sampling, and corresponding fitness outcomes to really link these relationships in a robust way. I'm biased, but I think the SOE sheep is a wonderful system to <laughs> try and address these um, sorts of issues. It's a really iconic long-term study system. There's a population of wild sheep on the island of St. Kilda um, in the Outer Hebrides in Scotland. These sheep have been studied since 1985. There's been over 10,000 of them um, in the study system since then. And we know a tremendous amount about them. So we have very accurate and comprehensive pedigree information for almost every individual. Each August, we take very extensive life history and phenotype information on our big field trip, as well as sampling for parasites and immune markers and that sort of thing. And over the last few years, we've also mounted um, a sort of charge to do some new initiatives, including more in-depth wild immunology, metabarcoding of the diet, metabarcoding of the parasite community, and increased sampling resolution. So previously in the SOE sheep system, most of the sampling was done at the August catch, as I mentioned, um, and we've now been sampling four times a year. The reason for this is all under the overarching aims of the project that I've been associated with for my postdoctoral work, which is the Ecology Within team. And the aim of this team is really to take a fine scale look at the host and environmental factors that shape within host communities, both of parasitic and commensal organisms, and then to ultimately relate these to variation in life history and host fitness. Um, the motivation for increased resolution of sampling across the year is because of what we call the sheep year, where the SOE sheep experience very different pressures throughout their year, which include for the ewes, for example, a huge energy investment in lambing and lactation in the spring and summer. For males, it's more of an energy investment in the mating season, in the autumn for the rut. So our sampling periods are sort of corresponding to different time pressures. And we have one in winter, early spring, in May, just after lambing, um, summer, just before the typical summer catch, and in the autumn as well. What this has resulted in for our four-year ecology within study is ultimately over 4,000 samples um, following 500 individuals in their microbiome. So it's this really nice, ultimately longitudinal and individual-based microbiome monitoring system. On the right here is an idea of just how longitudinal the span is for most of our individuals that we followed. So on the far left here is our first time point in the study. The far right is four years later, our final one. We started with a target list of mostly adults who are colored as sort of more green or yellow. And you can see that for most of those individual targets, um, we followed them through either the entire study period or until they've died. Lambs who have entered the system each year um, are in purple. And those that survive, uh, we have quite high fidelity of following them through. Where individuals have dropped out of the system is mostly due to high lamb mortality in the system. Um, so we have, for the most part, a quite a high number of samples per individual to work with here. We really wanted to use this data 
and to start to unpick concepts of microbiome stability and how these communities are responding to their environment, it was first important to determine um, how these microbiome communities are varying over time and what's driving those dynamics. So a large focus of the initial stages of my postdoc was developing methods that are suited to answering these questions. I worked largely with Luke McNally developing a novel GLMM approach which aimed to address some limitations in traditional microbiome methods for wild systems because many um, sort of statistical workflows did not necessarily account very well for very noisy ecological systems where there are multiple confounded drivers of the community and where there's repeated sampling of individuals and inter-individual variation. Um, so this work is out in M systems and there's also a tutorial for the models if anyone is interested. But ultimately the aim was to assign each factor of interest a variance um, that is associated with the micro microbiome community. So we can use these variance components to understand the key factors that shape communities uh, while also accounting for things like technical variation and having a lot of flexibility to fit in a number of random effects that are very similar to ecology and evolution um, models like individual repeatability, seasonal effects, and also things ultimately like genetic relatedness or social matrices as well. So they're quite flexible for that. Um, something that we found as quite a strong result from this pilot and methods-based analysis um, as an initial interest, uh, point of interest was that among our variance components, we found that age had a really strong impact on the microbiome. So the proportion variance here is about 20% explained by age just in this pilot data set where we collected um, samples from multiple ages within one season. And I was really interested in following up on this because as someone really interested in within host longitudinal changes, it's very important to first understand the degree to which there might be longitudinal changes that are driven by things like ontogeny or seasonal variation or a number of other factors in the system. So as um, part of the highlight of the sheep as a system to study this, I'll give an overview of um, an analysis I've been doing on in particular, the early life development of the microbiome. Early life is a particularly crucial window for development of the microbiome, essentially because individuals are born with very naive microbiomes. So there is sort of a blank slate within which the community assembly of the microbes that individuals are exposed to and which later make up their adult microbiome is really important. This is um, a figure from a paper by Kat Coit, and her group has done some really nice work in human infants and in experimental work where they've looked at the assembly processes that drive these communities. But it's very difficult to study in the wild because we rarely have the time window needed to look at that sort of naive microbiome stage. It's also difficult because there's a number of factors that could be shaping early life microbiome development in the wild. This can range from things like their diet as they age, maternal transmission, exposure to parasites in the environment, their spatial and social behavior, as well as factors that are happening within the community itself. Things like priority effects or some microbes arriving earlier may then have a big benefit over those that arrive later. The gut environment itself um, in terms of being suitable for particular microbes or others and competitive or facilitative interactions between these microbes. Um, and so to start to understand some of these processes, because there are so many, it's important to have a um, sort of longitudinal resolution of what is happening um, at the microbiome level over a span of early life. So I'll return to our sheep year diagram just to highlight the type of sampling that we're doing and how it corresponds to their ages. I think it's important to note that we sample adults in every season and at every time point. Typically in each year, we sample lambs only from July onward because they're only born sort of in April or May. So typically when they're old enough for to be producing a usable fecal sample, it is um, uh, sort of from the summer time point. Um, however, in the very beginning of the study in 2019, our um, field workers, Xavier, collected this really unique data set 
that was in addition to our normal sampling, which was 37 neonates, and they ranged from only a few days old to a couple of weeks old. So it's much earlier than we are typically able to sample the sheep. It represents a sort of novel insight into what's happening in their gut at that time. And ultimately, in conjunction with the additional time points in that first year, it gives us a longitudinal span of their microbiome from zero months old to one year old. Um, which we wanted to use to characterize the composition and the development of the microbiome over that time. So first to give an overview of sort of global differences between age categories from this sort of first year of data. We find, perhaps unsurprisingly, that alpha diversity increases dramatically with age, where neonates have very few observed taxa. Taxa here are at the resolution of amplicon sequence variant, which identifies um, taxa to one single sort of nucleotide difference. Um, so it's the highest resolution that we can use for the microbiome. Lambs already have significantly more ASVs detected than um, the neonates, and adults, um, unsurprisingly, have quite a high number um, and a fairly sort of stable high number. This is true whether we use sort of observed richness as an alpha diversity metric or others like Shannon diversity, and it seems to increase somewhat continuously into um, sort of older age across the years with the exception of some of the older individuals for which we have um, fewer samples. If we take a look at how the community itself is varying across these age categories, we can see very visually <laughs> that the neonates have both a much sparser and very distinct community to the other age categories. Whereas lambs, although they had lower diversity on alpha diver um, diversity scores, they start to look much more like adults sort of at this point. Um, so this is just a relative abundance plot broken down by genera within each of these communities. We can look at this not just visually, but sort of put some quantitative numbers on it. And I carried out an ordination using Bray Curtis dissimilarities for these groups. And we find, aligned with what we sort of see at the relative abundance plot level, that neonates cluster very distinctly, but also have more variation in their group, um, and then sort of progress as the year goes on into sort of the lamb stage, starting to look a bit more like adults. Um, and then adults have this very clustered, very similar microbiome in comparison to each other within their group. I was interested in just how long it takes the neonates to start to look more like adults over the course of the year. So I used each time point from that first year to compare the juvenile sheep to the adults within that time point and get an idea of how different they were across time. And at one point, we can say they have an adult microbiome. I did this by taking each value of um, the PC1 for the lambs and comparing it to the centroids of adults. And what I found was that Lamb microbiomes take nearly a full year to converge to adult microbiomes. Um, so significant differences in the PC1 of their Bray Curtis dissimilarities really remains until almost um, sort of spring of 2020 um, when they become a yearling. Um, so this is maybe a bit longer than I would have expected. It seems clear that there's this really important and stark differences that are occurring within very early life from spring to summer. Um, so I will just highlight some of the particular taxa that are driving these effects of the microbiome assembly. So for the next couple of slides, the way that these um, sort of data will be represented is that the zero line is no effect. If there's a phylum with error bars that does not span zero above the zero line, that indicates that the phylum is more abundant in lambs than adults. And so we can highlight just a few examples where, for example, we find that in the early months, in spring and summer of this sampling year, proteobacteria are significantly elevated in lambs compared to adults, and some taxa within this phylum are believed to be important for preparing the gut for colonization of other bacteria. Conversely, fibrobacteroda are significantly reduced in lambs compared to adults very early, but then increase later in the year. And these taxa are important for degradation of plant material. So this makes sense as the neonate's diet is changing from a milk-based diet to a plant-based diet that they will need to adapt to that. We can view this in a slightly different way. Instead of comparing adults to lambs, we can compare specific taxa and how they are changing from one time point to a next in both age categories. And that's what you'll see on the next slide, 
where, if you'll bear with me while I explain the slightly complicated situation, um, adults are in red, lambs are in blue. If the phylum is above the zero line, that indicates that it's increasing over time, so it's went up between spring and summer in the first two uh, sam sampling points. So you can see that there's lots of variation in the lambs, and they have a lot of taxa that are experiencing significant changes from those first two time points, whereas adults remain fairly consistent in the same taxa. What was interesting to me was that if we look at two time points from the tail end of this sampling year, or early spring 2020 and spring 2020, so when they're sort of becoming more like adult microbiomes, we can see that the lambs in blue are still experiencing some changes from time point to time point, but those, those start to mirror the changes that adults are experiencing. So it seems that rather than a development of the microbiome, it's beginning to be predictable seasonal changes that the sheep undergo. So I'll touch briefly on that to highlight that um, I was interested in also quantifying how much seasonal variation there is in the gut microbiome in the sheep. The age analysis suggested that there are some taxa that are varying in both age categories. The sheep are an interesting case because compared to some other systems, they have a fairly um, stable diet. So they're not changing diet components totally over the seasons, but as you can see here, they experience quite a range of conditions, and the vegetation does change in a meaningful way on Kilda across seasons. So I looked at the community composition changing over time across our four seasons. Um, we do find that there are seasonal effects on beta diversity composition that are not as strong as age, but do explain pretty consistently about 9% of total variation in the microbiome, that the largest differences are between early spring and summer. And briefly, these changes or taxa that are elevated in the summer are particularly associated with methanogenic bacteria, um, which we hypothesize is corresponding to changes in the diet availability of certain plant components. So as a brief summary of the soy sheep as a long-term microbiome system, we know that the gut microbiome is varying dramatically within individual by age and by season. Um, that the early life is a very crucial window for a lot of these changes and has a high degree of dynamism, and that seasonal variations might include specific sort of functional benefits to the host in adapting to the environment. To get sort of back to my bigger questions about inter-individual variation in microbiome stability and how it ultimately relates to host fitness, if we return to the population changes in microbiome over season in these sheep, you can imagine that at the individual level, there may be some significant variation that could have fitness outcomes for the host. So you might have, for example, an individual who has a trajectory like the red line that's sort of mirroring expected changes that we see at the population level and is adapting in a commensurate way to changes in the vegetation over time. You may also see an individual like the blue line that's sort of overcompensating and has very high degree of variation from season to season. This could be because the individual is, for example, undergoing changes because they're a lamb with a developing microbiome. It could be because they're ill, so they're more susceptible to changes in the environment, but could still spell negative consequences for the host. Or you might have an individual like the yellow line that's responding really not at all to the changes in vegetation, which could likewise have negative impacts for the host. Understanding this type of variation or how sensitive an individual microbiome might be to perturbation can be helped by understanding the network structure of the microbiome. It's hypothesized that the types of interactions that occur within these communities and the strength of them can determine the stability of these communities and their response to perturbation. And this has been explored in free living communities and in um, sort of laboratory microbiome communities and through modeling. One of the core concepts of this is that, for example, if the microbiome is dominated by a very few, very strong interactions between specific microbes, that if a perturbation comes along and disrupts those very strong um, sort of key interactions in the system, then the rest of the microbiome can be very destabilized by that. If, conversely, the microbiome is dominated by sort of weaker but very dispersed interactions throughout the whole community, it might be able to um, sort of adapt a bit more resiliently to perturbation. So to start to think about tools to classify the microbiome in this way, I've been thinking about the microbiome as a dynamical system 
and in particular have been interested in applying ecological forecasting methods and empirical dynamic modeling to the microbiome. This approach sort of relies on this idea that we can move between time series of members of a community to a state space representation of the community as a dynamical system as a whole. This method has largely been pioneered by George Sugihara's lab as a means of quantifying um, sort of natural time series and distinguishing chaos from linear stochasticity. But for me, a big interest and a way that it's been used has been to detect causality in complex ecosystems and to look at interactions by using these time series. The two sort of main outcomes then of this approach are to use individual time series and use part of them to see how predictable the sort of second half is. This gives us an idea of whether the individual members of the community and the community as a whole are sort of chaotic or linear or predictable. Um, and second, to use the time series to look at whether we can predict one time series from another, which would indicate causality. I'll focus on the second application of it and talk a little bit about whether we can infer the nature and strength of community dynamics that exist within the microbiome. Because time series analyses, certainly as proof of principle, really need a high resolution of sampling that's uncommon in the wild, I used a published data set of human microbiome data in which they did daily sampling of the gut microbiome for two subjects for a full year which was a lovely data set of almost you know, 365 samples um, for each subject, and also had some interesting time periods where they experienced perturbation via things like travel or infection. So it gives us quite a nice um, sort of framework to work in to test these. The criteria for whether microbes are interacting in this sort of analysis are one, does time series X predict time series Y above and beyond what we would expect from a linear correlation? And two, does the forecasting power increase with library size, or if you have more sort of points represented in that space, space diagram, do you get more information to predict? So I'll just um, give a brief overview of what I've been finding from this and how it's been working. Ultimately, what I've done is done a pairwise um, sort of causal analysis for each microbe within these um, two individuals over time, so used all of the time series. It was a lot of computational power, but it produces something like this, where if we look at um, the relationship between X and Y here, we see that the forecasting power is increasing with library size, which was one of our criteria, and the forecasting power is significantly more than the linear correlation, which was our second criteria. In this instance, both X and Y are affecting each other because they both um, are meeting those criteria. In another instance, this would be a case where Y is impacting X, but not vice versa, because the other one is not um, an improve, improvement over linear. Ultimately, this means that we can produce these interaction networks from microbiome data. And this gives us, first of all, a means to look at sort of typical network metrics to start to understand what the microbiome looks like as a community, and also allows looking at how interactions vary in direction and in magnitude. So if we imagine here that we have the time series of the relative abundance of species X, these um, sort of mapping approaches give us the effect of Y on X over the full sort of time series. So we can see here that Y on X, for example, has a negative effect for basically the whole duration. But this is not true for all other um, microbes in the system. So if we look at a random sampling here, we can see that some have negative impacts as well that sort of persist throughout. Some have positive impacts on X. Some have um, impacts that sort of cross the dash line quite a bit or change in direction over time. And what I'm working on right now is extending this to relating these metrics to perturbation, where, for example, in this data set, we know that we have a period of travel for one of the individuals. So I'm really interested in whether these periods of perturbation are changing the interaction strength or the nature of the interactions that occur within the microbiome. So overall, um, I've tried to show that relationships between environmental change, the gut microbiome, and the host fitness are indeed difficult to resolve in the wild. But individual base longitudinal monitoring is really important for starting to understand this variation in stability. Characterizing the network structure of the gut microbiome may be one way to help predict response to perturbation. And accounting for the microbiome likely, I believe, is important in understanding wildlife environment relationships. And I ultimately hope that it can be a means to help predict wildlife response to global change.
this concept of accounting for these complex communities when we try and think of large-scale dynamics leads me to my next part of the talk, which is investigating parasite interactions and disease emergence and highlighting the importance of focusing not just on one pathogen when we consider disease dynamics at scale but multiple. To kick this portion off, I'll start with one of my favorite sort of anecdotal incidences of an unusual interaction between parasites and return to a time when we were all social distancing. Individuals who were working in offices were moving in sort of en masse to working at home. And there were particular instances, for example, in Singapore, this meant that individuals who were typically working in offices that were very well ventilated and had low exposure to mosquitoes were moving to situations where they were working in denser environments at home that had higher exposure um, to Aedes mosquitoes. This resulted in this sort of unexpected increase in dengue cases from baseline for these individuals that moved from an office to a home setting due to the exposure to the vectors of this disease and represented an interesting sort of indirect interaction between these parasites where a very um, sort of robust means for combating one pathogen resulted in an increase in another because the sort of focus was on one pathogen itself. So I think it's a good example of how sort of shining the flashlight broader to consider the whole parasite community can give some interesting context to designing intervention strategies. And it also sparked some discourse surrounding the idea that COVID-19 isn't a pandemic, but if it's not a pandemic, then what is it? Syndemics or synergistic epidemics are a concept that stems from medical anthropology, which aims to determine both the social and environmental factors that can promote negative effects of disease interaction. They are, at their core, emergent properties, where they focus not just on an interaction between two diseases, but a driver that might put these two diseases sort of in a position where they can interact. Um, a vulnerability that might be caused by the driver. So these sorts of drivers could be things like um, climate in particular areas. In the medical anthropology context, they're often um, social factors like poverty. Um, and they ultimately produce interactions between diseases that importantly sort of worsen health outcomes. And overall, the entire sort of concept from driver to interaction is a syndemic. I think the um, sort of nuanced nature and the multifaceted nature of it is important because it indicates or a lot of the interest has been in um, the concept that if we target those sort of areas individually we can implement syndemic interventions which target not just the interaction not just one disease or not just two diseases but the fundamental drivers of those um, at some point um, I began to think about syndemic-like scenarios which are rife in nature, and I worked with some um, collaborators from the Verena Institute where we were really thinking through the fact that because co-infection is the norm in wildlife, syndemic framework might actually offer some insights into wildlife disease and rapidly changing environments by allowing us to really start to look at things holistically. And this was based on the sort of belief that syndemic life scenarios are really likely to emerge and probably do exist in wildlife systems, but just were unnamed as such. So we sort of wrote this um, concept piece in JAE a while back, trying to just set up a framework for looking at these sorts of interactions with the type of lens that medical anthropologists were using. This builds on an existent and very rich history of co-infection investigation in the wild um, that has done very deep dives into the importance of looking at ecology and interactions between parasites and how they might influence um, disease dynamics and was trying to just implement a framework for looking at this sort of holistically where we're looking at drivers, vulnerabilities, and the actual mechanism and outcome for the hosts that surround the actual interaction of the parasites themselves. This is important because as global change increases, we know um, from work that's been done at the sort of animal species level that changing climates will bring new species pairs into contacts that otherwise had not contacted each other before. 
that's expected to increase viral transmission risk. But we can also imagine that if new species of animals are contacting each other, that's going to put new species of parasites into contact that maybe have not been yet explored in a parasite community framework. So there's likely to be lots of parasite pairs that we don't really have a priori expectations for their interaction or how it might impact host. So starting to think about how we can maybe predict some of these um, is something that I've been interested in for a while. So this framework sort of highlights concepts like global change will increase novel pathogen interactions, therefore emerging disease responses might be hard to predict. Um, and so we, in the paper, set up this sort of framework where you can imagine that on a sort of spectrum of resolution of a synzootic, um, it's sort of helpful to try and pick apart what might be driving some of these vulnerabilities, the interaction between the parasites itself and how it will be impacting hosts. One of the very well-resolved examples is sort of all the way down the bottom here, where it's one of my favorite examples of a sort of synzootic scenario where drought in Serengeti lion populations was followed by heavy rains. And the combination of worsened condition from drought and ticks from the rains caused mass die-offs um, that were associated with canine distemper virus in this lion population. Typically, the lions did survive the canine distemper virus quite well, but because Babesia was transmitted by the increased ticks, which were unusual, they had much higher mortality. So although that's quite a good, well-resolved example, I think you'll note that in a lot of cases, the lines are sort of dashed or uncertain, or we really are missing the kind of drivers and vulnerabilities. So I'll talk a bit about how I think that experimental approaches can help fill in some of these gaps and some of what we don't know about the interactions. So I'll talk briefly about two experiments that I did in wild rodent populations. One manipulated the diet of these individuals in the wild, and one manipulated the parasite community. During my PhD, I was very interested in how resource landscape shapes disease. This is because resources are one of the things that's changing very quickly for wildlife as they have increasing contact with anthropogenic um, influence and with human communities. It's pretty well expected that the diet and the resources available to wildlife will change their outcome of infection via things like susceptibility or exposure to pathogens. So, Clustering around new sources of food might increase exposure to other animals and other pathogens, but conversely, better quality food might increase the ability to mount immune responses. So it could have sort of divergent impacts of the, these sort of changes in resources on infection. It was therefore fairly unclear what the net outcome would be at a parasite community level in multi-parasite communities, because often impacts of resources have been looked at um, in a sort of one pathogen framework. So I carried out experimental diet supplementation in a Scottish woodland. We had two supplemented grids and two control grids. On the supplemented grids, we essentially scattered these really high fat, high nutrient pellets. So the mice had access to much um, higher levels of resources than they typically did. Um, Grids were designed such that they were far enough apart, there was very minimal movement between them. So individuals that were on one grid, we were pretty confident were um, sort of part of that diet regime. And then we did eight weeks of trapping um, and measured a suite of behavioral com condition, immune and parasite responses so that we could really ask what the net out effects are of re resource supplementation in this very co-infected host. We know that these wild apodemus mice have upwards of sort of 10 parasites that are infecting them at any one time that we know of and that are at, of a high, high enough prevalence to detect. So what we found, just to dive right into it, is that at the between host level or on a sort of behavioral scale, we find that the supplementation, so here on the y-axis, this is results from the model where this is all effects of the nutrition supplementation, had huge impacts on their behavior and really reduced their movement, home range, and contacts because the mice were sort of shrinking the area they needed to cover or the foraging they needed to do because they had a lot of food available to them right on their doorstep. This resulted conversely in increased density because they were sort of shrinking the area they were covering. So presumably they had more mice around them because they all sort of were in place more. If we look at the within host effects, we find that although these aren't very significant because there was a lot of variation, in general, the supplemented mice had higher condition in terms of higher immune responses, slightly higher sort of condition and weight and fat score and that sort of thing, um, which could have 
divergent impacts on the parasite community as a whole. So I then looked at, um, I think, 12 different parasites within the system to see how these condition and behavior effects were manifesting. I found that there was a really diverse and dramatic range of effects on the parasites. So we have, for example, some Imeria species, which are protozoan parasites in the gut, murine herpes virus, H. polygyrus, a very well-known gut worm, um, ticks, trypanosomes, fleas and mites, Bartonella species, and another helminth, capillaria. Uh, most effects were negative or reduced by supplementation, but some, like the mites and capillaria and Bartonella, were increased by supplementation. In addition, um, some of these affected parasites have known interactions. So within this system, we know, for example, that H. polygyrus, the gut worm, and Imeria, the protozoal gut pathogen, can interact and compete for space. So it seems like diet can really dramatically change the parasite community. This can have onward transmission dynamic effects in that some of these changes in one parasite may have downstream effects on another. This was a fairly short sampling time period of um, sort of eight weeks. So it would be great to follow up and see if some of these rippling effects through the parasite community are then resulting in interactive effects. Um, but for now, I think um, it's quite a stark impact of changing environment and changing a community of parasites within a host. Um, one of the things that changed in response to this nutrition supplementation was this reduction in an important worm H. polygyrus. The next experiment I'll show is from some work that I did in a paramiscus leucopus system at Mountain Lake Biological Station in collaboration with Andrea Graham. These mice have many similarities to the UK wood mice that I was studying, uh, with the exception that they also are host and reservoir to a very important zoonotic pathogen, Synombre virus. So we carried out, carried out an experiment where we experimentally reduced the nematode population. Um, this is, figure is just showing that if we look at the nematode prevalence on the y-axis, we do see a strong reduction in nematodes post-treatment for the mice that were treated. Uh, but what we also found when we looked at other parasites was that um, post-treatment, treated individuals had higher prevalence of Synombre virus, indicating that there was some interaction between the worm and this virus um, that was disrupted and um, sort of thrown into a bit of chaos when we put the um, deworming medication into the system. Um, and this has quite important implications for onward transmission of that virus, not just within the mouse population, but also to humans and is interest, an interesting sort of complement to the nutrition study because, for example, that was a case where helminths were sort of naturally, or not naturally, but experimentally reduced by um, a diet manipulation. It's very possible that those sorts of um, diet changes are occurring naturally in the wild. So if there are changes or reduction in helminths that are occurring naturally, it could have unintended or unexpected consequences for other pathogens in the system as seen here. So the takeaway from these two experiments, I think, are that the entire community of parasites is really key context for understanding impacts of potential anthropogenic changes on wildlife, and that changes to one parasite can result in unexpected consequences for others. Finally, I'll just end on what I've been working on more recently in this topic, which is the importance of accounting for these pathogen interactions at a global scale. Much of our work at the Verena Institute focuses on what drives the host virus network. I would say I'm interested in the virus-virus network. And to take a preliminary look at this, I use the USAID PREDICT surveillance data. I used it to then construct a network of which viruses were co-occurring frequently with each other. And ultimately, I hope that this can be a platform for incorporating co-infection information into the host virus network via things like taking a deeper look at the geographical areas studied and the host studied and seeing if they have impacts on um, sort of which viruses are co-occurring um, or whether we can use information from these networks to test some of these interactions experimentally. A brief overview of what we found, this was mainly in collaboration with Colin Carlson um, on our team, was that among the sort of 65, over 65,000 sampled animals, there was slightly over 3,000 PCR positive animals and 223 of those were co-infected, um, which is shown on the right here. The red dots are the co-infected ones. That does seem like fairly few, but given the prevalence of a lot of these viruses in this data set, that actually is um, potentially still happening at a sort of greater than random 
level. So we next looked at constructing the actual network of which viruses were co-occurring with each other. It looks like this. We find that, for example, orthomyxoviruses are co-occurring quite strongly with coronaviruses, as well as paramyxoviruses. Um, and we find that if we test these edges to see whether they are occurring at a greater than random expected rate, that basically all of them that seem to have a strong edge are indeed. Another project that I've been working on with the Verena Institute in collaboration with July and Barbara here at the Cary Institute, as well as Greg Albury, is whether these interaction networks might actually be biasing our understanding of some measures of parasites at scale, like richness or prevalence. I'll give a brief overview of this project, which has been largely um, led by a lot of intrepid modeling by July, and just sort of highlight the conceptual aspect of it, which sort of is based on this idea of how we measure species richness. In a really ideal or simple scenario, we can imagine that if we have three populations that have respectively four, three, and three pathogens, that if we were to measure the richness of those, we would hope that maybe you'd sort of reflect what they actually have, with the exception of maybe, say, in one population, we underestimate because the prevalence is really low, so we're not detecting it. But what is likely actually happening is that there's interactions within these populations that could change our estimates of these sorts of um, summary metrics. So for example, in population A, if this worm species blocks a virus, we would estimate that by one fewer species than it has if it reduces the virus such that we're not really detecting in the population. Um, similarly, in population B, that might reduce our estimate down from three to two. If competitive interactions are really reducing some parasites, then it will influence how we're measuring those um, in a systematic way. And um, in population three, if there's a facilitative interaction, that might sort of actually recover the detection of a parasite that was otherwise missed because it was very low prevalence. So I think as some takeaways, I'd like to highlight that pathogen interactions can likely alter disease emergence and dynamics. Synzootics are probably occurring in wildlife and could increase under global change. The prediction and prevalence estimates um, that we typically use could be potentially improved by longitudinal monitoring, monitoring ideally of multiple pathogens across a wide range of hosts. And it's possible that approaches that account for these multiple pathogens and their interactions could potentially be more effective than focusing on one pathogen in isolation. I hope that as a broad takeaway, I've given um, some convincing that better understanding of these within host community dynamics could ultimately scale up to more informed predictions of wildlife health. And I'll end by acknowledging and thanking my microbiome team, our ecology within team, which represents a very um, wonderful and diverse team across many institutes, um, including um, Edinburgh, Sheffield, the Morden Institute in Liverpool, um, among others, and also acknowledging folks that contributed to the parasite work. So my um, apodemus team, Andy Fenton, Amy Peterson, and Simon Babayon, as well as Andrea Graham for the wood mouse work, um, Colin Carlson, Dan Becker, Greg Albury, and Evan on the synzootics work, Colin on the predict co-infection dynamics, and Barbara, July, and Greg as well for the um, co-infection bias work. Thanks so much for listening. Happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Sweeney. Um, uh, for those in the audience, if you could speak loudly, and Amy, if you could just repeat the questions for, for those online. Um, Anybody want to start with questions? I have a ton, but I'm going to try to save mine for other times. Go ahead, Jane. Thanks so much. Um, I'm really curious, uh, with your um, data from the, the sheet, uh, are you following the same individuals microbiome and trying to see that uh, kind of time series data? I know it that can be hard, but uh, yeah, like how much are you able to follow individual variation versus always having to take a kind of community average? Yeah, of course. So for um, virtual folks, the question was really how much we can look at within individual um, variation for the same sheep versus um, kind of community levels. Um, the answer for that is um, that it's this system is quite well suited for that individual variation. So we have 16 total time points for the four-year study um, because we sampled four times a year for those four years. Of our about 400 individuals for about 50 of them. We have time point, we have samples for every single time point for them. Lots of the individuals that we don't have the full span of time, fan, uh, time points, it's because they've experienced mortality at some point over the study. Um, 
but the average number of samples per individual is still quite high. So I think it's something like um, about eight. And some of them we have multiples as well. So one thing that I'm really keen to carry out over the next few years, um, if I can fund it, is more intensive time series in the wild so that I can apply ecological forecasting methods to the wild. I think right now we can look at these same individuals multiple times, but the sampling resolution is a little bit spaced out and that the samples were about three months apart. So I'm really curious how that time scale will correspond to um, sort of like variation over the course of weeks instead of months. So the sort of short answer is that we do have really high fidelity for the individuals. So the initial, some of the initial analyses I did were looking at kind of community level changes over time just to get a sense of what's happening. But the sort of what's being, what, my ongoing work as well is um, really focused on the within individual level. Um, and we do have a lot of power for that as well. <laughs> Yes, so that is a good question. Um, there is some um, nuance in those results that I didn't think I would really have time to get into, but it is definitely true that the interactions vary by host a bit in that data set. So for example, bats, rodents, and poultry are the species groups that have the highest rate of those co-infections. Um, so they seem to dictate a little bit that there is some impact of which hosts are being sampled that influence how common it is that you'll detect those interactions. Um, I am um, sort of finalizing just now some GLMMs which are trying to take into account different levels of information from that data set, like geographical area as well as the host information, um, to have a good look at that. I think because the data is somewhat coarse or really large scale, and because it is effectively co-occurrence um, sort of matrices, we can't definitely say for sure that it's an interaction because often to detect an interaction, I struggle with this a lot in wild data, you need either sort of experimental proof or you need sort of the longitudinal data to show that one is responding to a change in the other. So I think the hope is that if we have some insight from what factors come out of the models that are driving some of these interactions in the network, then down the line we can sort of test experimentally some of those virus-virus pairs, um, either in kind of cell lines or maybe in sort of a laboratory system. And I think that's one of the things that I think about a lot is trying to pair whatever we can get out of wild data and then pair that with sort of experimental testing so that we can try and construct somewhat robust hypotheses or a priori expectations when we try and incorporate this type of information into predictions. Oh, sure. <laughs> So, yes, um, that's a good question. So for... Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so for <laughs> folks on the Zoom, the question was whether the diverse impacts of resource supplementation on the parasite community can be related to um, some of the exposure susceptibility processes that we detected. I think, unfortunately, the answer is that it's a bit complicated. And some of what I started to allude to at the end of that in terms of longer range of sampling being useful for starting to determine whether those um, disruption to the parasite community results in change interactions between the parasites is also somewhat true for relating the exposure and susceptibility processes. I do know from um, a first paper that came out of that supplementation experiment 
that the changes to condition and immunity are driving the reduction in the worm response in the worm results for sure. I think because the changes to behavior are all on the same time scale as the reduction in parasites. And it's a fairly short experiment. So I did put some of the behavior metrics into the models to see if they have sort of a causal link. And some do come out. But I think probably the um, most honest answer is that we need a little bit longer span of sampling to really see if those um, changes in their behavior result in um, sort of downstream effects on the parasites, because I think it's all a bit temporally correlated to very definitively say it. But in short, we do see that there are definitely some of the condition responses responsible for some of the parasite decreases, and that some of the increases could be caused by some of these behavioral, some of the results from the models indicate that that is the sort of direction of what's happening, at least. Sure. <laughs> oh, yeah, go ahead. Sure. So, um, yeah, for Zoom people, the question was whether some of the changes observed in ontogeny in um, regard to the psoas sheet microbiome could be driven or related to changes in things like cortisol or reproduction um, or relatedness between individuals. Um, so the answer there is that that is something that I'm trying to workshop a bit with the um, GLMM models now because the four, full four years of data, um, I've sort of just processed all of that fairly recently um, from the sort of end of our project. And the models that we developed to analyze these are well suited to putting things like we have the relatedness matrix for the individuals, so we know who's related to who. We also know things like um, how much their space use overlaps, so that will likely be important because they sort of hang out in different areas of the study system. Um, and of course, we have their reproductive status and whether they've had a lamb that year or so. Um, basically, there are computational limitations to uh, the models because it's an incredibly complex data set. So I'm, I'm sort of working through just now incorporating some of those results um, or seeing what a trade-off is between mon modeling things at the ASV level, which is many, many, many rows um, of as a response variable um, and fitting in the maximum number of drivers that we can put in. Um, so that, um, I think that the, so from what we know so far, like for example, the effect of which, how, um, of the ewes or the mums on their lambs is pretty modest. So I have looked at that in terms of the ontogeny changes and it does seem to be more that um, it's sort of happening at an individual level and not super influenced by the maternal microbes, um, but that was at a fairly coarse level of the whole community. So it might be that there's sort of specific microbes that have particular benefits that are the important ones coming from the others. So. Mm -hmm. And I was 
Yes, um, so that's a great question. I'll paraphrase it um, as well as I can. Essentially, it boils down to the fact that the sheep as a system are fairly stable compared to some other systems because they have um, subtle variations in the environment and season and vegetation over the course of the year. And there may be some other systems which are experiencing much more pronounced variations in their climate or other factors. Um, so that's something I've been thinking a lot about for future work and in terms of comparisons. Something that got me thinking about this is that, for example, um, there is a long-term study of the microbiome in the meerkats um, in the Kalahari Desert. They exhibit these really strong diurnal oscillations, and that's because they feed at a very particular time of day. So I read that paper. It's like, that's really cool. I'm going to check that in the sheep. The sheep have no variation during the day because they just graze all day. So it really did get me thinking about how the life history of the hosts might be impacting the time scale at which their microbiome changes. So I've designed a lot of the work that I'm doing on investigating stability and within individual changes of the microbiome as it relates to the environment in the sheep, because I think it's a great system where even if the environmental changes are subtle, we have the sort of full span of information that we can really develop some really robust metrics and sort of set up a framework for understanding um, how those longitudinal metrics might relate to fitness. Something I'm working, working on kind of for longer term goals is using any available data that um, sort of is out there on longitudinal wild microbiomes and trying to make a sort of open data repository of cross-system um, sort of uh, microbiome information so that we can start to compare these longitudinal metrics across systems and maybe start to model whether it is things like just the area that they live in or the species of host that is shaping how much inter-individual variation there is in, um, because I think a lot of comparative work focuses on kind of static measures of the community. So yeah, the whole sort of like trying to like have a, a sort of big, um, both for my own work and just in general, kind of think more about moving toward more dynamic measures of it, both within focal systems and across different systems. <laughs> much we have we also have questions online but i'm going to actually save them and okay. just I'll, I'll pass them on to you um, later um, but thank you so much um, amy for making the trip and thanks for everybody for joining us thanks so much for having me <laughs>